Well, it's time now for our Facets of FS segment. Joining us is Tim Latch. He is the Insect and Plant Disease Technical Manager. Tim, you know, my first thought is we've got, if we don't have water standing, we certainly have some wet soils. Is is this a particular time where you would think about sort of any kind of, of plant diseases that may come about? Am I thinking right that, that wet soils can contribute to that? That's right. We saw uh, a lot of rainfall activity over the weekend, uh, variable uh, in amounts from north to south across our territory. But um, certainly enough rain uh, at a critical stage in the development of the crop to uh, cause a number of different concerns, yes. What kind, like, I guess we could go, uh, we could talk plants and then we could also talk insects. So uh, what, uh, like when I'm thinking about corn necessarily, does it matter if it's emerged or not yet emerged as to what diseases we might have to look out for? Uh, that That is true. Uh, corn that has not yet emerged uh, that's subject to this much water um, is prone to a number of different uh, pathogens that may affect the plant. Uh, we treat these or call these the corn seedling disease complex because there are a combination of different pathogens that are responsible, uh, including uh, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora, uh, several different uh, species of Fusarium. Nematodes can uh, attack the, the corn seedling plant prior to emergence. Uh, so uh, all of those things uh, can can uh, cause significant problems uh, prior to the seed coming out of the ground when we have wet conditions like we see now. Uh, the, the difficult part about dealing with the corn seed disease complex is that the symptoms are really non-distinct. And so it's difficult uh, and maybe often impossible to differentiate whether it's a herbicide injury because it's either sometimes confused with that or uh, could potentially be confounded. You know, one of the things that since the fields are too wet to work anyway, you know, we we especially if it's something that is pre-emerged corn or pre-emerged soybeans, there's nothing we can do anyway. So do is it just the best remedy to see if they can fight their way through any any kind of kind of problem? And I know it's a little bit soggy to be getting across the fields in in some situations, but uh, as soon as we can get out there, uh, we should be. Uh, because we could see um, a whole host of uh, other problems with uh, uh, corn seedlings that have emerged, uh, particularly this year. I mean, we've seen a lot of reports uh, about heavy black cutworm moth blights this past spring. Well, we have had some uh, reports coming in uh, related to black cutworm activity, uh, larval activity. Um, if, if it's early instar, uh, early larval development, uh, these rainfalls actually may have a, a negative impact on their populations. It may it may actually cause uh, mortality of some of those uh, early stage instar black cutworms. But as the as the cutworms get larger, uh, the the wet soils are just going to force them up to the surface, and they'll be feeding above ground anyway. So if the corn has emerged uh, and it's at that V2 uh, V3 stage. Uh, and we've got large cutworms out there. Uh, we want to be uh, particularly cognizant, uh, you know, of potentially getting some uh, insecticide applied to to those crops. So, making uh, you know, making a determination for treatment based on the size of the corn, uh, the size of the larva, and uh, you know what uh, what corn population is at threat, really, to determine the need for control. You know, I've heard guys from U of I talk about cutworms. I've heard agronomists for seed companies talk about cutworms, and now I hear you talking about it. Is is this a a midwestern problem? Is it an an Illinois problem? It, it it must be a problem if everybody is specifically talking about cutworms this time of year. Well, I think the moth blights and the captures have been relatively widespread across the Midwest, and so there is certainly a potential for a big cutworm problem. Uh, that would also be uh, true for regions within those geographies that are uh, experiencing delayed planting, uh, because then you get a, you get the uh, uh, coinciding of the cutworm at the right size with the crop at the vulnerable stage, and so uh, those delayed planting geographies more toward the south uh, certainly would be a higher risk, I would say, for that. Uh, as well, but uh, I think it is a fairly widespread phenomenon across the Midwest this year. And is it regardless of what our 
crop pro, crop rotation practices are? Uh, well, the fields that are most at risk with black cutworm uh, would be those fields that either had a uh, cover crop uh, that was killed uh, in the springtime, uh, or may have uh, you know that uh, kill may have been delayed, that burn down may have been delayed. Uh, or fields that uh, where we had delayed tillage and, and didn't get a herbicide put on, and we had some weed growth early. Uh, also, fields that would be adjacent to permanent vegetation like pasture or CRP ground, hmm. those will all be at greater risk uh, for black cutworm development. So it, it's not necessarily the crop, cover crops bad, but if I burn it down later than I wanted to, then that could be a bad thing. That's right. The moth prefers to uh, prefers vegetated habitat to lay its eggs, uh, which will then become the uh, cutworm larvae. So, uh, any place where or any field where there was vegetation uh, standing uh, in a time frame that's close to when the crop was planted uh, could be at risk. Okay, you know it's one of these things where we we've heard, you know, it's an El Nino weather pattern, and so that's good for growing corn and, you know, the crop is in the ground and so everybody's going to have a great year. It's easy to jump to those conclusions, but there's a lot that has to get from point A to point B and whatever the harvest is, if that's point Z or not. But it's it's no slam dunk, is it, that it, that crop is just going to go gangbusters on us? No, uh, in, in my particular geography, we've, uh, we've seen over the last seven days, uh, really in the last three or four days, uh, the corn crop has emerged. And it looks like we've got really good stands uh, across a lot of fields. Uh, and I think that's probably true a lot of other places in Illinois. We see we're, we're off to a good start, uh, but we certainly don't want to lay down on the job at this point uh, and ignore potential, um, you know, stand-robbing uh, problems like black cutworm or secondary soil insects. Uh, the, the problem with many of these things is black cutworms, you can actually apply rescue treatment. Uh, insecticidal rescues are available for black cutworm. Uh, but the secondary soil insects like white grub, wireworm, seed corn maggots, uh, th- there really is no rescue treatment available. And so you're, you know, you're really vulnerable if you haven't taken preventative steps uh, and applied a, a seed treatment based insecticide or a soil applied insecticide at planting. Uh, and you find you have those problems um, after the crop comes up, there's really no option available to you other than to evaluate how much stand loss you have and to make a replant decision. Uh, so, um, you know, even in some of those situations, um, you know, I think uh, we can't be too complacent about uh, the corns in the ground and, and we're off, off to the races. It's the second time I've heard about seed corn maggots, too, which just sounds like a tremendous nuisance so that that's that's good that that i'm hearing these these different messages from different folks and you know you mentioned so let's say i've got a cornfield near pasture and so i'm gonna have pasture you know that is if not permanent that's pretty darn close to permanent or crp you know those are long-term contracts or you know pasture land is going to most likely has been there for generations so does that mean that that there could be uh problems with with resistance over time, because if, if that was a problem this year, it was probably a problem last year, and it may have been a problem 20 years ago, too. Well, resistance is always uh, something that needs to be managed regardless of uh, the environment, I would argue, uh, that we've got to be good stewards of our uh, crop protection tools that are available to us and make sure that we don't uh, apply undue selective pressure against those. Sometimes certain habitats and certain uh, you know, crop rotational practices will will put extra pressure on so it does imply an extra level of management, I think, to manage resistance. I think the other thing, um, the last I didn't mention earlier, is if uh, you know those weren't enough problems to be concerned with, <laughs> we are seeing a tremendous uh, number of moth captures on um, true army worm uh, in Kentucky, and now Purdue in just the last seven days has announced that they have changed their trapping method and they are catching uh, vastly more moths than they were before, and they think they may have underreported army worm moth flight um, over the last few weeks. Uh, these numbers are as high as we've seen uh, since the record level outbreak of army worm in 2008 in Kentucky. Uh, so I, I don't want to like sound the fire alarm yet. I don't want to cry wolf uh, about this issue necessarily other than to say, please keep your eyes open for army worm as well, because 
uh, the potential is there. Certainly the moths are flying, and if uh, the right environmental conditions persist here over the next um, two to three weeks, we could have, you know, some pretty significant armyworm problems. And unfortunately, armyworms um, uh, like grass species. And so here again, we get back to CRP and pasture. Uh, those are ideal habitats for uh, egg laying for armyworm. And, you know, the armyworm gets its name because once it depletes one food source, it marches in mass to another food source, which might be the neighboring corn crop. Yikes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, here again, uh, the, the army worm is something that we need to be watching for. Uh, I would encourage everyone to be actively scouting right now while the corn is in this vulnerable stage. Well, last Wednesday, Angie Peltier at the Northwest R&D Station said they caught a whole bunch of army worms. It's on her blog, too. So, again, that's another message we had heard before, and that, that, sounds, that sounds pretty dangerous. I'm thinking, too, about I know I've got at least – a few farmers that know that go non GMO, some that go no till non GMO. So, you know, what, what choices do I have, especially if I'm going with a non GMO plant? But in, th- in this case, I'm thinking about soybeans, but it, you know, it, it could be, I guess, whatever crop it is. If I'm going non GMO, what kind of choices do I have? Well, unfortunately, uh, GMO traits don't provide a lot of protection against some of the insects that we've been discussing to this point. Uh, so, I think uh, all of those conventional farmers are going to be in exactly the same boat as uh, anyone else would be in that front. Did we freeze a bunch of them the last couple of years, or is is this is this always been a problem and I just don't have a good memory about it? Well, I, I think insect problems you could probably characterize as always being um, somewhat localized. Uh, rarely ever do you see an insect or a disease problem that is a widespread sort of pandemic uh, across the Midwest. And some years, uh, conditions set up, uh, like 2014, uh, last year's growing season was the perfect storm uh, for sudden death syndrome development. Mm -hmm. And so you did see somewhat more widespread uh, impacts, but uh, it would vary field by field depending upon the susceptibility of the variety and so on. So some people experienced some, you know, major yield losses. Others didn't experience much of anything. Uh, but I would say it was, you know, as close to, a, you know, a widespread uh, disease problem as you're probably going to see. Um, unfortunately, here again, uh, the conditions that we've got right now with a lot of the soybeans uh, first going in the ground here uh, over the last, um, you know, 7 to 14 days, um, these are one of the two conditions that favor development of SDS as well. You have to have a wet spring and you have to have wet and humid conditions at flowering. So we've got one of two uh, to set up for another you know, problem here with potential SDS and soybeans also. Hmm. This isn't just a guy looking for problems for the sake of having something to talk about either. I mean, this is, this is serious business. And, and how often do we need to be scouting, especially if we see any kind of whether that's army worm population or cut worms, you know, how how often do we need to be out and about as much as possible? Well, I, I like to tell our crop specialists that, that scouting is a full season activity. Um, when the, the crops are at, in the earliest stages of development, uh, they're probably most vulnerable uh, to attack by certain insects. And uh, each crop in each specific stage of development uh, has certain concerns and certain worries that you need to be watching for. Uh, so uh, it's hard to, uh, you know, it's hard to sort of pinpoint, hey, I need to be looking uh, uh, at this crop every seven days would probably be a minimum uh, when it's in a, you know, a young stage of development. I would say more frequently than that if possible. And, hey, if the ground's too wet to... Uh, do any tillage or planting, uh, it's a perfect time to get out in the fields and see what's uh, happening with the crop. We haven't talked about wheat much yet, Tim, but for those who had to deal with scab last year, I'm just wondering, we've got temperatures cooling, we've got wet soils, is is it uh, festering time again for, what is it, fusarium head blight, is that the right term? That is correct. Uh, you're well educated on this topic. Um we're we're seeing a lot of wheat now that's entering the growth stage of either flag leaf emergence or even starting to uh, produce heads. 
And uh, as you know, those final two leaves on the top of the plant account for the photosynthetic activity that drives more than 80% of the, of the grain fill of the head itself. And unfortunately, we also have some conditions here setting up with you know, high humidity and continued intermittent rain uh, with somewhat warmer temperatures. You know, temperatures that are in the, you know, the 70s to 80s range are, again, an ideal setup uh, for potential problems with fusarium head blight, uh, which uh, I'm sure all of our listeners know uh, is associated with uh, vomitoxin production in the wheat. Uh, so um, we've got a lot of locations uh, across our operating uh, trade territory that uh, are staging applications of Prosaro this week, which is a combination of two triazole fungicides. The uh, triazoles are, are the ones that we typically turn to uh, to manage fusarium head blight because the strobilurins, which is another major class of agricultural field crop fungicides, can't be really applied uh, effectively after flag leaf because they're associated with increased risk of vomitoxin formation in the plant. Uh, so uh, we're seeing a lot of folks uh, gearing up to apply for sorrow uh, to the wheat coming up here. And we have an exciting, uh, potentially exciting new product available. We don't have a lot of experience with it yet. It's just now uh, coming into the market, uh, but it's called Fungifite Cereals. And it is a phosphite-based fungicide uh, that's labeled for suppression uh, of the vomitoxin, specifically when used in combination with the triazole fungicide. So we're hoping that uh, we can get a few, uh, few people interested in uh, doing some trials of that product this year uh, to see if it has any impact or not. I'm surprised that I actually knew the name of a condition, but I am well aware of the dock at the elevator, so I guess that's why... That stuck in my head so well. So thanks so much, Tim. Good to visit with you, and uh, we'll have to do a follow-up on this and see how everything's going. That sounds great, Goss. Thank you for having me. That's Tim Latch. He is Plant and Insect Disease Technical Manager with a laundry list of things to keep an eye out for over the coming weeks and months. Army worms and cut worms and sudden death syndrome, you name it. it not as easy as it sounds to grow a 200 bushel an acre corn crop or a 56 bushel an acre soybean crop. There's a lot of work between now and then that has to take place. Stay tuned. We'll have more next on Good Time Oldies 1290 at 102.7 WIRL and 1290WIRL.com.